Good morning. Whoa, that was about as awesome as the other mic. Kids, it is time for Kids Church. So uh, have fun as I struggle with this little clip. Good morning again. How about that? Pastor Brad had a, a few days he, he took to recuperate. I think he got even better at woodwork than he already was. I think that's where he was. But how many of you know that in, even in Monticello, Indiana, where we think we have it all put together, it, it's not easy being a pastor. It's not easy wiping noses and taking care of us sheep. Sometimes we demand a lot on a guy like him. And... Uh, when he goes to recuperate, he needs sometimes just some, some times to be a, a man, right? And we forget that, I think, about pastors. So I just want to honor him. And for all the things I know, we're as stupid as real sheep are sometimes. And you've done a lot for all of us. And uh, if you can, just a life song clap for Pastor Brad and all the things he's done. Somehow, somehow, he trusted me enough to talk today. And I think that's good. We'll see where we go with this. Uh, I got a couple scriptures I want to start with. Genesis 1, 28. I, I, I follow a guy who says every good sermon's got to start back in Genesis 1. And I, and, I, and I have, I think there's some truth to that. Genesis 1, 28 says, God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every other living thing that moves on the earth. And this is God's first command to man. Be fruitful and multiply. Galatians 5, and 23 is where my heart went when I read that. And there Paul lists, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So in other words, you want to do these things? There's no law that says there's too much. Just do them all you want. Eat till your heart's content. Eat some more. Eat more after that. You can't eat too much. I'll never tell you to stop. And I think that's important. And these two things go together. And if I had a title for today, it would be Love Fruit. Love Fruit. And it works both ways, right? Because I love fruit. I just ate a big, fruit, big juicy Fuji apple this morning for breakfast. And... Uh, Boy, it was good. You know, sometimes I think I'd rather have a Fuji apple than a big candy bar. Genevieve, what's your favorite fruit? Mango. Mango? Oh, we'll take it. <laughs> it's an interesting fruit. Everybody else got a favorite fruit? Mango. All right. Mango, peaches. We'll take it. So, uh, so I love fruit. But Galatians says the first fruit, and I think it's interesting that it's listed first, I don't think it's an accident, is love. And then the Holy Spirit just gave me this image. You know, there's a lot of scripture uh, that, that talks about us being some kind of plant, some kind of organic, some kind of tree, right? If you go to John 15, John 15, 1 through 5 says, Jesus said, I'm the true vine, my father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. <laughs> While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it becomes even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I so I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yet how often do we point at our fruit that we put up on the tree by ourselves and say, look at that. I got, a, I got a piece of fruit on my tree. I did it myself. If it wasn't still winter in April, I'd have a short sleeve shirt on and you'd see a tattoo on my left arm. It's kind of an airbrush job and it's Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. This one means a lot to me. And it says, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord. It says, he'll be like a tree planted by the water that gets what it needs from its roots. And whether it's a hot season or a cold season, it doesn't fear, but it always produces fruit. Now, the image of that, another time, 
Uh, Jesus told a parable in Luke 13 about an orchard manager and an orchard owner. And the manager of the orchard was happy because the owner came home and he wanted to see what was going on with the orchard. And there was a particular tree in the middle of the orchard that wasn't bearing any fruit. And the manager says, check this orchard out, it looks pretty good. The owner says, what about that tree right there with no fruit on it? He says, why should it use up good ground? Cut it down. The manager says, <laughs> give me one more year. He says, let me, let me take this year, dig around the roots, and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to dig them up, I'm going to dig the roots up, loosen the soil up, and I'm going to dung it. I'm going to put fertilizer on the roots. And in all these scriptures, even in that manager, which is a picture of grace, and thank you, Jesus, for the grace he gives us, right? Even in all that, what I see is, we mess up the difference between fruit and fruitfulness. Fruit is what you see. But the process of fruitfulness, I mean, it's a process, right? But religion gets a hold of us, and we say, well, fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, you know, maybe I didn't grow up in a way that I knew love. But I know I'm supposed to because I go to church and they talk about the fruit of love. So here's my tree, and I got a banana, and I'm going to take some some masking tape, and I'm gonna, I gotta wrap it on there because when I get to church, people gotta see that. Or maybe joy. Maybe I'm depressed because I never did get over that thing that happened to me, that divorce or whatever it was. And, and I know when I get to church, people talk about joy, so here's my joy. I put it on there. Boy, this looks even stupider than I thought, isn't this funny? <laughs> <laughs> How about gentleness? Well, I grew up and my parents didn't treat me right, you know? Not me personally, uh, but, but I did never know a gentle parent, and so I don't know how to be a gentle parent, but I know I'm supposed to be gentle, so I'm going to talk about me being gentle. I'm going to try my best, and I'll do, it, I'll do it mental ascension. I'll do it my way. Now, we get even stupider. <laughs> I don't know all the fruit, so I found this little plastic can of mixed fruit. That was a great one, <laughs> right? I'll cover all the bases. Let's just hurry up and put it on there before somebody sees that I'm not very fruitful. I'll make it look good. I'll take my can of fruit on there. And then we get really stupid. Religion then, we don't even make it about the fruit. <laughs> we forget the fruit. And we start talking about, well, if we're going to do it with our heads, let's talk about behavior. Let's talk about rules. Well, I'm holy because I don't drink. So I'm going to put a potato on there. Ain't even a fruit, but it looks good. <laughs> I'll cut a corner. Here's a slice of an orange. And, you know, close enough to fruit. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't cuss. I'm better than everybody else. I, I'm holy because I don't cuss. So here's a piece of, here's an orange. Now check me out. I'm a fruitful tree, right? That looks so corny. <laughs> I'll skip down. I think my point is made. The point is this, that is not fruitfulness. That's fruit, but it ain't fruitfulness because fruitfulness has a process. It's got to come from where you can't see, and it's got to go through a healthy tree. Judy Peters knows about this. You can't have an unhealthy plant that produces healthy fruit, can you? Everything that's not right at the fruit level has to go back to the root level. <laughs> and my gosh, the problem is that takes a while. That takes work to dig around the roots. That's not easy to do. Warren Buffett said once, he said, forgive me for this, parents. <laughs> he said, a man can't have a baby in a month by getting nine women pregnant. Some things just take time, okay? And this is one of them. And when we don't have fruit on our tree, that's okay, but we gotta embrace the process. We gotta encourage each other to embrace the process of digging down to the roots because if you want real fruit that comes back, you know, what's going to happen if I take the fruit off the tree? Does it grow back? Not this one. Because it's not a fruitful tree. So I guess that's just a challenge to religion in that <laughs> we make it about fruit, but let's go back to being a church that makes it about fruitfulness. Where was I? Because that was fun. Okay. So let's go back to the first fruit of love, right? We say we love fruit. We say we love ice cream. I love Taco Bell, kids, if you know me. Wyatt knows I love Taco Bell. It's the greatest fruit. I don't even know. But I also say I love my wife. 
Now, how can we use the same word to talk about how we feel about ice cream and how I feel about the woman that I love more than anything in the world? That's what we do in America. It's the same word. But the Greeks knew better than this. They had all kinds of words. Some people say they had eight. But in Scripture, we talk about four words for love, right? We talk about philia. Or that, that's the city of Philadelphia comes from that. That's brotherly love. Can I get a hallelujah, Pax and Snowberger for brotherly love? We know all about that. When two men have some things in common, you spend some time together, that's brotherly love. There's nothing wrong with brotherly love, but it's a type of love. We've got another kind called eros. You can probably figure eros out. That's, that's where we get erotic love. I heard a guy say once, that does not mean a man saying, I, I want women. That's, that's not eros. It's a man saying, I want my woman. Can I get a hallelujah, Heather Obermeyer for <laughs> eros? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the next one is storge. It's called storge. That is an empathetic love. That's the love I have for my kids, and hopefully my kids have for me as a parent. That's the love you have as a family. You got, you got empathy for each other. And then number four is agape. And we've all heard this. If you've been in church for very long, you've heard of agape love. And, and it sounds good, right? Agape love. We got to love one another. We got to love each other. Well, we know that. But agape... <laughs> was once defined by somebody as incomparable benevolence. Incomparable benevolence. A goodness towards others that refuses to be conquered by their lack of goodness towards you. And I thought, wow, you know, I've been taught that about honor, and I do my best to, to make honor my code. So when I go to a restaurant and the waitress is having a bad day, she still gets a good tip because honor is my code, not hers. And I think that's stronger than being victim to how somebody treats you. But I wonder if we shouldn't do the same thing with love because God did it for us. Agape love says, I'm going to love you like God loved me, regardless of whether you reciprocated or not. So when you hear the word love the rest of this sermon, think of agape. We're not, we're not talking about those other levels of love. We're talking about agape. And, and wherever you read, it was in the original translation written as agape. So... Uh, we go to John 13 next, and, and here Jesus is making his last comments to the disciples before he leaves. And he says, a new command I give you, love one another, agape one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Now, <laughs> Here's a challenge to you. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. When's the last time somebody said to you, I can tell you're a great man of God or a woman of God because of how you love people? Now, it seems to me, and I'm as victim to this as everybody, we make it about being holy, right? We want people to know we stand out because we don't do this and we don't do that and we don't smoke and we don't tell dirty jokes and we don't do these other things. But that's not what Jesus said. Now, Jesus came to fulfill the law. He never broke the law. He didn't say the law was less important. Don't get me wrong there. That's very important. The Ten Commandments are important. All the rules that are in the Bible are important. But what if Jesus really wanted to emphasize, and we kind of miss it, that this is really what makes you a disciple of Jesus? Not by whether you uphold the law, which is important, and which we will do, but how we love people. I want to be a part of a church that's known for that, right? Like maybe, hey, I know where that guy from Life Song was Wednesday night, but look how he loves people. And I know this guy's still working on some things, but look how he loves people. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. I think that's, I think that's a comforting thought. So John understood this word in a special way. I want to show it to you. A little different than we understand it. If we go to 1 John 4, John wrote about it and he said, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves God has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son to the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he just flat out loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. 
Catch this. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete. Just like that phrase at the beginning about love fruit works both ways. It works both ways. Tell your neighbor it, look, it works both ways. That's right. Look, I'm like Happy Gilmore. I, I don't like quiet golf games. A little bit of participation helps me out. I need a little bit of that. So it works both ways. A good sermon works both ways. When I'm talking and you say amen, there's something there, right? Worship works both ways. Thank you. <laughs> Worship work, works both ways. If you're just standing up here singing on stage and, and everybody's got their hands in their pockets looking at their shoes, Genevieve, that's not working both ways, is it? There's a certain energy. The anointing flows when it works both ways. Relationships, uh, relationships work both ways. Any of these kinds of love. I remember a, a while back, a guy that's kind of a mentor of mine, I hadn't talked to him in a while, and I called him and I said, I'm sorry, uh, it's been a couple months since we've talked, I'm sorry. Uh, just sorry we've been out of touch. And he says, it's all right. He says, the last time I checked, my phone goes both ways. He says, it works both ways. It's on me too. Anybody ever been in a relationship that didn't go both ways? But what? <laughs> you weren't supposed to say yes. <laughs> well, relationships aren't supposed to be that way. But when John's talking about this kind of love, this is anything but a relationship that goes both ways. He says, this is how God sent his love. Not that we love God, but that he just loved us. And you know, every good relationship, I think, needs an initiator, right? Because it's not always easy. And I think, and you don't have to agree with me, and I know it's 2023, but I think the man should initiate in a relationship. Don't you think so, Emily? Yeah, there you go. I don't always practice that. <laughs> I'm not always great at it. But I think the man should be the initiator. And that's what I see here, is that God is the initiator of agape love. You know, he did it. He sent his son. He is love. And he brought it down, and that's the example for us men. And that's what we're supposed to do here on earth. I'm an ambassador of that kind of love. Amen. Yeah. So, uh, the important thing to understand about, God when he, about John when he speaks about love is his relationship with Jesus. And a special part about, about this you may or may not know. John is like one of the few people in the history of the entire planet that, that gave himself his own nickname, and it stuck. And I think that's cool. Remember the old Seinfeld episode where George Costanza wanted a nickname? All his friends had nicknames, and he's like, I'm going to eat T-bone steaks every day at lunch. And everybody, you know what I'm talking about. Every day, everybody will see me eat a T-bone steak for lunch, and they'll, they'll call me T-bone. That'll be a cool nickname. And so he gets T-bone steaks for lunch every day. Nobody catches on, and he throws some kind of fit where he's flailing his arms around, and he looks like a monkey. And one of the bosses sees that, and he says, we're going to give you a nickname today, Coco the Monkey Boy. <laughs> and that's how it goes when you try to give yourself your own nickname. Tyler, do you know anybody with a nickname? What, what's the nickname you gave me? Your best friend who's an adult. And I nicknamed you my best friend who's a kid. And that nickname sticks. And it's important because you gave it to me. That's why it sticks. You know, there's nicknames in the Bible. You see... <laughs> Here's another thing I observed. The man with the withered hand, right? The woman at the well, blind Bartimaeus, uh, uh, you know, crippled people, blind people. We don't even know their names, but we call them by what was wrong with them. And you know, left to your own devices, that's what we'll do. We'll identify you by what we see that's not right. So it's hard to get good nicknames. Heather's got a good nickname. <laughs> Some nicknames you're not so proud of, but they mean a lot to the person that gave them to you. Heather's nickname is Baby Bird. <laughs> she can't stand it, but it's a term of endearment for me, and it means a lot. So anyway, sometimes nicknames don't stick. Sometimes they do. They're not always things you're proud of. But uh, John gave himself his own nickname. Check out John 19. John 19. John is writing. He says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There's four women. How about that? Don't you think women are better at love than men? I mean, that's what, women are made to nurture, men bring order, but there's really something about women that makes it so good. Here's four women standing at the cross of Jesus. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved. <laughs> 
I got to take the mic off and cry at this because how cool is that that John's writing about himself in third person. And he says, I was there. But he doesn't just say I was there. He says, Jesus looked down and saw his mom and the disciple he loved. That's me, he says. John, the one he loved. Now, how silly is that? Six times in the New Testament, John calls himself the disciple whom he loved. Now, do you think Jesus didn't love the other 11 disciples? Do you think he loved the other 11 disciples any less? I don't think so. I got five kids. And <laughs> don't judge my parenting style, but at any given day, I've told each of them that they were the most handsome or the funniest or the smartest or the prettiest. And one-on-one, -on -one, I tried to all make them feel like a million bucks. And what I noticed is, even though I told them all those things, some of them were better at receiving it than others. And I can't help but wonder, I, mean, I don't know, it's not in scripture. I'm sure Jesus was one-on-one -on -one with all his disciples if John wasn't just better at receiving that love than the others. And interesting enough, in the New King James Version, which I first learned this in, John writes, it's translated as beloved. Instead of, uh, you know, the people he's addressing, he says, hey, beloved, uh, here's what I got to tell you. And, and instead of the one who Jesus loved, he calls himself John the Beloved. And I think hidden in that is a neat little message, right? Because when people come to church, we give them all kinds of be things to be, right? You're supposed to be pure. You're supposed to be holy. You're supposed to be better than you came in. You're supposed to be more honorable. You're supposed to be heterosexual. I mean, we come up with all these names. But what if hidden in this is really the first thing before you can get any of the others of just to be loved? Just be loved. And some of us aren't very good at being loved because we didn't grow up in a way that allowed us to be loved. And we spent our whole lives trying to chase this thing, understanding that we'll never be a healthy tree that can be loved until we finally figure it out of the roots. So this is how life is. We, we experience our perception, and John experienced his. John addresses everybody as beloved, because he did receive that kind of love, and he was able to pass it on. I need uh, a bag of, about a two-pound bag of change. Who's got a two-pound bag of change? <laughs> Nolan, where are you at? I need two pounds, a, a couple of pounds of just miscellaneous pennies and quarters and dimes and nickels. Look at that. Nolan's got it. Funny, he just came up with that. Now, how, how did I know that Nolan was going to have exactly what I needed? Because I gave it to him before the sermon. And I think this is an important point to take away. God doesn't ask you to give anything that he didn't first give you. So when he says, this is how everybody will know you're my disciples, but how you love one another, he's given you that love. It's agape love that never runs out, that you can pass on forever, but some of us just aren't very good at receiving it. You know, if Peyton Manning's throwing me passes, but I got my hands in my pockets, it's not the passer's fault, it's the receiver's fault. And I think sometimes I drop that ball, I'm guilty as anybody. I just don't catch the pass right. Something else I noticed about love is, just like the tree, that's so stupid, look at that tree. <laughs> love shows, right? If it's a fruit, and the indicator of a fruit is that you can see it, right? That's, after all the process, uh, when a woman's having a baby, we say she's beginning to show. Look at your neighbor, Mark, and tell her she's beginning to show. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you're beginning to show. <laughs> I might have just started a fight. You might have to call the police. <laughs> you better not be beginning to show, Heather, please. No. Oh, Jesus' name. But that's the way it is with love. When you start to get this love inside of you, you know, it's, it's, it's not finite. There's nowhere for it to go. And when you receive it right, you've got to show it. It's got to come out. <laughs> and I think really this is the foundation of following Jesus. You know, the other stuff comes as a, as a result of this, but this is what I want to be better at. This is what I want to be good at. It's just loving people unconditionally. You know, so if, if you, how many people have a relationship or a friend that's difficult to love sometimes? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm burning myself all day here. 
Here's my suggestion. Next time you pray, why don't you ask God how he does it for you? Because the last time I checked, every one of us has days we're difficult to love. This is how God loved, that he just sent his son. And on a bad day, he loves me like he does on a good day. And if I want to get better at that, why don't I go back and study how he does it for me? I had a professor in college named John T. Ying. John T. Ying, he's a little Japanese guy, he's about four foot ten. And that was clearly not his name because English wasn't even his second language. He was, he was not a very good English speaker. And I had trouble understanding him. He was my economics professor. And he said, Crass, what I want you to know is economics is all about leverage. <laughs> leverage, he talked about leverage every day, leverage is about what money's about. Leverage is about what business is about. And isn't that how we treat life? Like in the natural, everything's about leverage. Like you're in a business negotiation, you're looking for the weak spot on your guy across the table from you. You're, you're in, a, uh, in a courthouse, you're looking for the weak spot, you're looking for leverage against your, the other guy. And if we're not careful, I think, because the world operates this way, we'll apply those principles and think that God looks for leverage on us. You sit at a table, you, you try to figure out your kids' weak points sometimes. I mean, maybe I'm just a bad parent, but I grew up doing that as a, as a young parent. Oh, uh, because I want to know what they like. Take it away from them when they don't act right. So, <laughs> oh, you like Legos, Tyler? That's really interesting. Hmm, I'll have to remember that next time you don't mind, right? This is what we do. Oh, you like uh, uh, Netflix? Well, guess what, kids? Next time you're in trouble, Netflix account goes away. But God's a better father than I am. <laughs> he had all the leverage in the world. He had the law. And I think the whole Old Testament is just to show us that we could never live up to the law, no matter what we did. That's why we even had to give sacrifices in the Old Testament, you know, doves and perfect lambs. We had to give things because we could never live up to the rules of the law. Romans 8, 3 through 4 says, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. What's he saying? He's saying the law wasn't enough leverage to change our hearts. So we had to do something better. God said, finally, now's the time. Before time was invented, we had this plan. Let's put it into place. The, law, the leverage of law is not enough. And the people should know this by now. I want to use a different leverage. I want to use love. Amen. You know, love will take you farther than the law ever could. Amen? Amen? But that religious thing wraps around our hearts, and it, it makes us always go back to the law. I was reading some of the rules of the Talmud. You know, we made 600 and something rules back in the day. And some of them are like, I'm not making fun of people who practice Orthodox Judaism. I'm not. Uh, but, you know, some of the rules we made as men, we all did it, we're all guilty of this, uh, are, are a little absurd. You know, on, on the Sabbath, they, they can't kill a fly because it may be construed as hunting. And we think somehow if we, if we do that, it'll make us closer to God or make God happier with us. Another one was you can't drag a chair across the floor on, on the Sabbath. Make sure you pick it up and move it, because if you drag it and there's dust on the floor, it might be construed as plowing, which is work, and you'll be guilty. Now, how absurd are those rules? And do they change your heart? Of course not. They don't change your heart at all. So if the law <laughs> is not enough leverage for lasting change, then what is? When we get together as church people, right? We'll get together and eat lunch, eat dinner, and we'll talk about the condition of the world. And the world's going to hell in a handbasket. And what are we gonna do about it? Well, if we're ambassadors and we're gonna to listen to John and Paul, we're not going to use the leverage of the law to, to change the world. We're going to use love. How do we expect people to follow a God that they don't know until they fall in love with that God? You know, I remember, remember the Karate Kid? Wax on, wax off. He hated those lessons. He, he just wanted to learn karate. He didn't want to embrace the lessons until he fell in love with the process. And the day that Mr. Miyagi showed him, show me wax on, you know, and he understands, oh, this is how you apply it, practical application. When he fell in love with the process, he couldn't get enough of it. I remember basketball was that way for me. You know, I got tired of the drills and the, the passing and the ball handling. 
when we actually got to start playing the game, and in those years for me, Michael Jordan was just coming on the scene. I fell in love with basketball because I saw what Michael Jordan could do. And I approached practice different because now I love the game. And my challenge to you today is how do you expect people that aren't here today to want to follow the rules of a God they don't even know until they fall in love with that God? And isn't that what an ambassador's job is? An ambassador doesn't come in, kick your door open, kick his feet up on your desk and smoke a stogie and say, tell you what I'm going to do today. Here's the rules. Nobody wants to follow that guy. An ambassador comes in and delivers only the will of the king that he represents. And it seems to me, if we cut through the stuff, the will of this king is agape love. You know, you can sign a legal document to get married. But if the love is gone, what's more important, the love or the law? The law breaks. The law is gone. It says, this is how God showed his love. He sent. And the disciple that told us this, the only one that was left there, he was the most loved. He wasn't the loudest. He was the most loved. Peter was the loudest. Peter wasn't there. You know, I noticed this in sports. The loudest fans are usually the first ones to leave. I remember we went to a Steelers game once, and we sat right in front of two really obnoxious Ravens fans right behind us. Thousands of Steelers fans, two purple jerseys. It was the dad and his son. <laughs> they didn't even know the players they were rooting for. They were just yelling, receiver, receiver, you don't know what you're doing. Of their own team. But they were loud. They were louder than all the Steelers fans around them. And at halftime, the Steelers were down by 14 points. And these guys just kept getting louder. In the third quarter, the Steelers scored three touchdowns, and God's will was served that day. They went on to win that game. <laughs> and what I noticed is as soon as the Steelers got up, these two loudmouths left. And, you know, I noticed that about life, too. The loudest are usually the first ones to leave. And I hear people say all the time, I love my church, or I love my family. Well, I got a challenge for you. You've never loved anything in your life you didn't support. And I can take a good look at how much you love a church or how much you love an organization on two things. How are you furthering its cause and what your giving statement look like? Because that's what we do. When we love something, we support it. So Jesus said at the cross, woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. Why did Jesus do this when, when he had brothers? I mean, his mom had people to take care of him. Well, I believe what he's doing, it's related to the cross. Can we all agree that the cross is the ultimate symbol of God's love? I mean, that's why we have it here, right? That's, that's why we, we look at it and it should remind us, this is where God's love came down. This is where, you know, even if I don't get my expectations met by God, the cross reminds me he still loved me. And, you know, even if I didn't get that job I needed, thought I needed he still showed me he loved me at the cross. This is where his love came down. It said he sent his love. He showed his love at the cross. And I believe it still flows down today to the, to the worst of circumstances. I believe that the cross shows that God's love still comes down today to the most dire of circumstances, to the hardest of hearts. God's love, it just flows down. Because, not because it's a cross, not because it's magical, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. The cross bearer, after I did a little study and I realized, you know, it makes for a good Easter movie. Mel Gibson looks pretty cool carrying a big giant cross on his shoulder. Uh, that makes for good Hollywood. But what I really looked when I studied is the, the guilty, or in Jesus' case, the innocent, the accused, wouldn't have carried the whole cross. It was, it was too big. It's just physically impossible. He would have carried... The cross beam, the horizontal part. And uh, I think it's interesting to know that, you know, the vertical part was already in the ground. So you're carrying the cross beam to the destination where the vertical part was already there. They nailed that up, and that's how they hung it. And, and follow me here, because uh, the symbol of the cross was that Jesus once said, take up your cross and follow me. What's he talking about? Not the whole cross. He's saying this. God's love already came down. The post was already in the ground. When Jesus died for us, the vertical part was already done. And that's where God's love came down. And he's saying, 
Woman, here is your son to the one who Jesus loved. And, and man, here's your, hus- here's your wife. <laughs> Sorry, man, here's your mom. Uh, and what he's saying is, here's the horizontal part. The love came down, and now you've got to pass it out. The cross works both ways. Isn't that beautiful? And that's our job. And what he said is, until you love one another, the cross isn't complete. He said, I need you to make this complete. I need you to make this image perpetuate every day. So, woman, here's your son. And man, here's your mother. That's a command he gives to us today. That's a command he gives us to the second we walk out that door, to the first person we come eyeball to eyeball with. you got to show that agape love as an ambassador. And the other stuff will take care of itself. Nobody wants to walk out looking like some corny tree with masking tape on it today. Let's start working on that organic process of being a fruitful tree. Other thing about fruitful trees, you know, when you have love fruit all over your tree, we do this sometimes, right? That person hurt me, you know, that's coming up for a piece of fruit. I remember 10 years ago, that person gave me a funny look. That person talks bad about me. And, and we'll try to move the branches and pull it away so that person can't get fruit off my tree. The funny thing about a tree is it has no say-so in who gets to take fruit off of it. It stands there, and it becomes an attractive force. And you look in the woods, you look in, in nature anywhere, when there is a big, fruitful tree, animals come from all over to that tree. It's an attractive force. And I think that's what Jesus wants from us. He's saying until we love each other that way, organically, not in a fake way, the cross is not complete. So it has to work both ways. You can't give me what I haven't received. So you have to be loved. And we got to encourage each other to be loved. There's a good story about Martha and Mary. You know, at the end there, uh, Martha was doing all the giving, doing all the loving. And Mary just sat down and was receiving. And there was some frustration there. And Martha thought she was doing the right thing. And she says, aren't you going to tell Mary to help me? And, and what Jesus said was, basically, <laughs> there's a season for everything, right? You can't just give out. You can't just give out of your own accord. You can't just give out of your own love. That's manipulation. That's a finite source. And what happens is you'll give out, and you'll give out, and you'll give out till you give out. And you got nothing left. And the image there is you've got to be loved. You've got to receive from him if it's the kind of love that will never run out. You've got to find balance. They say what goes up must come down. Well, today I say, you know, what goes down must go out. So let's get better at this as a church. Let's be the church that everybody says. That life song church, those guys are a little corny sometimes. That's just fine. But boy, they love me in such a way I can't stand but want to hang out with them more. That's the kind of love Jesus has got for me. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to, to present your word and make it alive and active. So have it touch our hearts, and Holy Spirit, have it guide us this week so that we just don't have a half hour here on a Sunday, but a real Monday morning application moment, a real all-week application opportunities. You put them in front of us, and we will say yes and amen. We just want to love the people you put in front of us. Thank you for the things you've done for us, things you're doing for us, and the opportunities we don't even know about yet. And we love you, and we thank you, Jesus, for the way you love us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's do this. Let's close uh, with a word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to have the prayer team come forward. If you need to receive any prayer today, we would ask you to come forward and receive. Uh, They'll be here to minister whatever uh, your situation or circumstance is and uh, pray with you. So would you guys go ahead, stand up, and let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you this uh, day, Lord, this morning for just the word which has been preached. We thank you, Lord for the challenge to uh, give out what you have given us so freely, which is love. 
And Lord, we thank you even for these uh, demonstrations that uh, Chris gave today. I think it puts things into perspective and gives us uh, uh, something we can see with our own eyes to understand uh, the lessons of the scripture, and it's a, a good thing. Lord, we just pray over this time as we invite those who need to receive prayer. We uh, pray, Lord, over this uh, moment. We ask, Lord, that your uh, spirit would lead us, uh, and we pray, Lord, that uh, for those that are struggling even this morning or just need to receive prayer over any situation, Lord, that they're currently dealing with, Lord, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would, in fact, minister to those circumstances and, Lord, that uh, we can walk out of here knowing that there are answers ahead. And, Lord, we just uh, thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.